But, um, well, thank you everybody for attending and um, welcome to the uh, Royal Sydney Yacht Squadron's Cruising Division regular fourth Wednesday of the month uh, meeting. Uh, we're doing it on Zoom, obviously, and we have done that since about uh, March or April. But we're hoping that tonight's uh, going to be our last Zoom meeting. So um, but we hope that the regulations will relax and we can meet in reasonable numbers of people in, in person. Um, could, because our next meeting uh, that's scheduled is, is for the 10th of December, which is our Christmas dinner at this club on the 10th of December. And if you look on the cruising division part of the website, you'll be able to see the, the booking uh, details for that. We're limited to only 50 people, so um, you better make your reservations fairly early so that we can, uh, so that you'll get a seat because we can only have five tables of 10 in the whole of the Carabella room. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing that Christmas function. Um, there's another couple of things I'd just like to mention before I hand over to our speakers tonight. Uh, in, on our fourth Wednesday of the month in January, the 27th of January, the day after Australia Day, we've arranged for Hugo van Kretschmar, who's um, a very experienced sailor and an ex commodore of the CYCA. Uh, he will present his very interesting and lively accounts of his cruising in his big wooden trawler, which he's traveled all the way from Australia in, uh, but he has cruised around the very top of Norway and the Arctic and Spitsbergen, uh, Iceland, Greenland, and uh, not only that, he's very good at um, videos and photography of rare things, so I've seen a little bit of that once before. It's a, a really interesting presentation. He's a, he's a good presenter. So hopefully by the 27th of January, well, our, our COVID uh, regulation will be more relaxed and the club will be able to have slightly more people in. We're hoping to get, well, have a dinner for that night and put 120 people in the Caravella room if all goes well. So we'll keep you posted on that, but uh, it should be a very good night. And um, just secondly now, a couple of admin details. If you um, have any uh, questions or uh, comments to make during... Row and Bob's speak tonight, speech tonight, or talk tonight. Uh, there's a down the bottom. You'll see a raise your hand uh, icon. You can click on that, and then James will be recording those people that raise their hand at the end of the uh, talk, and then we'll have a question time, and James will get back to you and uh, ask you what was he wanted to say or ask. And uh, alternatively, there's also down there a chat function, which you can click on that and you can, if you wish, you can type in a question or a comment and we'll deal with those after the talk. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rosemary and Bob. Um, Jill and I have been very fortunate to know Rowan and Rob for probably longer than we care to put a number on, but um, for a very long time, and we can definitely vouch for their cruising credentials. Um, in, until quite recently, they've always been intrepid sailors of sailing yachts. And they've had quite a few sailing yachts and they've covered a lot of ground in them in both Australia and overseas. Um, in Australia, they would have sailed in a variety of boats from the very bottom, the southwest part of Tasmania, right around the east coast of Tasmania and across the top and up the east coast of Australia and every nook and cranny to probably, I don't know, far up in North Queensland. So uh, they've done a lot of Australian cruising and then they spent, I think it's 10 years um, in the Mediterranean with their Veneto 50 and they covered a great deal of the Mediterranean from France to Spain to Italy. Um, they, they know the Dalmatian coast of the Adriatic extremely well. And they've been to Greece and Turkey and um, they've got a lot of experience there. <coughs> um, and in their spare time, they've managed to produce, I don't know, it must be, I haven't counted, it must be at least four or five coffee table books of their travels, which are excellent photographs and commentary. And Rosary's produced three novels and Bob has written um, two volumes of his History of the World from the Back of a Boat which I particularly myself enjoy as well. 
uh, I could recommend all of those books. But however, not so long ago, uh, Bob and Roy went over to the dark side and they bought a motorboat in Holland, the one you can probably see on the screen there at the moment. It's a very luxurious 50 foot steel, uh, beautifully equipped motorboat. And um, then they set up their adventures to cruise all the inland waterways and rivers and canals of uh, Holland, Belgium and France. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight from Bob and Roe. And um, I'll hand over to them now and let's hear the story. Thank you, David. Over to Hello, you. everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, yes, well, uh, that's our story. In, in 2016, we we're uh, sitting at a taverna in uh, Greece, and uh, I had about five years to run until I was 80, and Roe was threatening to uh, trade me in on a younger man at that stage. So we developed a plan of uh, selling the sailing boat and uh, going to and to buy a boat to do the French canals, basically. But after uh, looking at boats, we found that the, the best place to buy a boat was uh, Holland. So uh, at the beginning of 70, of uh, 17, we flew into uh, Sneak and uh, went to a great shed full of boats which is a uh, shed over the water, which most, most of the boats in uh, the north of Holland spend winter in, under shelter, in the water, but under shelter. Uh, so we went to Sneak, and uh, after looking at three or four boats, bought uh, the boat we fell in love with, which was uh, Lena, which is uh, a 40-foot boat. I exaggerate the size a bit. Five, 4.3 metres wide and had an air draft of... Uh, 2.7 metres if everything was taken off and 3.5 metres if the canopy's up. And those specifications will take you, will allow you to go just about everywhere and drew 1.1 metre, would allow you to go anywhere in, uh, in, in Europe, basically. So David, uh, can you hear us? It's just that our um, screen hasn't lit up with us talking, but can you hear? Loud and clear. Oh, I'm, seeing that's a, cool. I'm seeing a picture of the water gate at yes. Snake at the moment. So we started our um, we we started our trip in Snake, uh, which is in Friesland, um, and um, I'll just go back to the uh, to the map there. So Snake is is um, is here. We we found um, pretty much found the boat on the internet, a little bit like we did with the one in the Mediterranean as well. Uh, and uh, we arrived on a Sunday morning, uh, and basically um, uh, Lena. That we, we found her, as Rob said, in, in a you know, huge warehouse, uh, and she was ours within in, in a day. And uh, uh, we, we, we set off uh, from Sneak uh, and up to, uh, to head up north. But Sneak's a lovely, lovely town if everybody, anybody wants to go there. Lots of lovely restaurants um, and the, the people very friendly, a few chargeries to set up. Uh, and uh, we were really, uh, we had to set up from, totally from scratch. With, uh, there wasn't a thing on her, but uh, there were shops here that we, we could do that with. Um, so um, so uh, our initial idea was to buy the boat and head down to France, but we soon fell in love with Holland, which is uh, a magnificent country and it certainly was neglected in my education as a kid and I knew almost nothing about it. But it is a marvellous country and um, it's, uh, if we can get, just go back to the map a bit. Mm. Um, the uh, inland sea that you can see there used, used to be a big bay and it characterises the, the uh, nature of, of the Dutch uh, personality. For, for a thousand years they used to be flooded and bombarded by, by storms coming in from the North Sea but finally in, uh, in uh, 1933 they built a uh, dike across the top of this bay and created this fresh water or it was started off as a salt water uh, lake, but the waters of the Isselmeer and the uh, the Rhine eventually flushed it up and became a huge uh, freshwater lake and the basis of irrigation for the immense amount of rural produce they turn out. And showing you just the photos that, that if just about everybody in Holland has a boat or a bike uh, or both. Well, most of them have both and the bikes go on the boats. But uh, this is uh, a typical example of a, um, a, a wonderfully uh, old but uh, solid and uh, tremendous um, sailing boat, which they um, were using for a trading school. In Sneak itself, 
there's a you know there's a magnificent saving school for young kids and uh, actually where we found sneak uh, uh, lena uh, was right in the very heart of that so we had a bit of fun uh, there um this is believe it or not the councilman going off to a council meeting um so um, they uh, well, I think probably the meeting. I think probably they were off to have a bit of a boozer, uh, but um, that's how they went. There were about five or six boats. Uh, they're all dressed like that in their suits and uh, and heading off. So uh, we were just tied up to uh, the shore there, um, which is just a little bit back, and uh, they um, they came past us and um, were having a jolly time. But you can pull up anywhere, um, or mostly uh, to um, the side of the shore, whether you happen to be in a town. Uh, or whether you're in the, um, this is in the lake. Uh, this is in Sneakers Mere, which means uh, Sneaks Lake. And for uh, if you join the society, which is from uh, all across Friesland, which is the northern province of uh, Holland, and paid 30 euros, you can stay any night on moorings such as this for, for three days. Pig was one of the first towns we went to. Um, and, um, uh, at, well, like, like Dockham, um, which uh, we're going up further north there. I'll come to the map that I'll show you again. Um, you can just, that's us um, here. We're, we're anchored just a little bit up there. You come in, tie up, um, electricity, water, uh, and then the, the town was just literally over the hill there. Um, this is the award, and Rob's got a big grin on his face because in the park next door, the girls were having a protest that uh, they weren't allowed to take the tops off, but the fellows were. Uh, so they took, ripped their blouse, uh, brows off and uh, hung them on a tree. Uh, so Rob's obviously enjoying himself uh, watching the, the passing scenery there. Um, so we're up here in, in Lea Warden uh, and heading right up over the, the north uh, and across to Groningen. But on, on the way, we came through uh, a lovely lake called uh, Krom Rakin, which uh, has different sort of architect, uh, and um, arrived in Groningen, where, apart from it being a university city, uh, had the most fantastic array of um, houseboats. And you'll see, um, I'm just showing where we are up, up here in Groningen again, uh, but you'll see the variety of houseboats. Some of them were done up beautifully. This is obviously a, a floating art studio. Uh, and then um, another gorgeous one with a garden, but then something that had obviously been left there forever and a day uh, and was just rusty. Um, so leaving, uh, leaving Groningen, we're starting to get out into the, the back canals now. This is uh, running along parallel to the German border, probably about 2.5 metres deep. A lot of the uh, modern technology is left behind and the, these are all operated manually, generally by men in their 60s who uh, might look after five or six bridges or uh, locks and either ride or go by motorbike from one to the other. Uh, so they're all very fit uh, older people and the Dutch put a lot of effort and money into maintaining their, uh, their locks. They see them as a, a national cultural asset as well as a, a big tourist asset. And they're all beautifully maintained and, uh, and everyone is hopeful and friendly. And very grateful that you give them a, a little tip at the end. But I don't know whether many of you have been, I'm sure you have been through the Denali Canal down in Tassie where you throw your money in a bucket. Well, this is just a different version of that. The girl's got a clog out. Uh, and um, this was a boat coming behind us and uh, she threw her money in the clog as I had done just previously um, uh, coming, uh, coming through. Um, you can tie up a lot in a lot of places in Holland, although a lot of the banks are hard to get a stake in to, uh, to tie to. But if, if there's a spot you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can tie up and generally from such a place you can uh, uh, walk to a restaurant. Uh, there are a lot of interesting, Sorry. interesting um, things you see on them uh, in houseboat uh, style. This is actually a houseboat with its own little mooring and the brand is uh, uh, at the side, just pull up to make a, a secure box to leave uh, for just, winter. Fascinating, it just all closed up. So that, you know, there were a few of those, but there's a uh, different for forms of architecture. This of course is going back to the sort of traditional uh, Dutch house. Um, and um, this gorgeous little one, which uh, I can imagine being tied up to the jetty up, up the, at the front. But it's amazing um, because you literally, 
uh, are sailing in their front garden, uh, right up to their front door. Um, and then we arrived at uh, Hootson and found all these um, uh, old barges. Most of the canals, even in, uh, in relatively industrialised area, there'll be a green corridor that the uh, canal goes through so that no matter where you go, it, it's picturesquely lined by trees. Even if there's a major highway 500 or 400 or 200 metres away, there'll be a, a, a very big line of trees which preserves the privacy of the lake. And this, this is a mob of uh, tugboats which spent most of the summer driving around in a group of probably uh, 30 tugs. Oh from festival to festival from town to town and drinking lots of beer, where uh, we were introduced to some of the Dutch beer, which is 9% uh, uh, alcohol and is really very refreshing on the, on the occasional hot day. <laughs> we did have. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but as you can see, yes, they're very proud of their, their um, um, ships and the little village of Elburg, uh, a little fishing village. So the contrast of the boats, modern sort of uh, cruises there back to the um, original little um, uh, yachts and uh, fishing boats and uh, whatever there, but it was a gorgeous place up the back streets, lovely little restaurants, as there were in most places uh, that you could go and um, dine in. Um, now we've come down to Amsterdam. Um, we came down through uh, um, Meppel, which was this area there where our grandson, we were very lucky, Hubie joined us there uh, and came with us for a long trip back down into Amsterdam. And uh, Amsterdam, uh, well, you can't sail right into the middle of it, uh, but of course you can leave your boat out in the marina and then come in and catch all these little small tourist boats and uh, go through all the, uh, the canals there. And I'm sure many of you have been there, so um, you, you'd know exactly what it's, uh, what it's like. So the world's uh, first stock exchange was in uh, Amsterdam, where uh, people started trading shares in the East India Company, which I didn't realise was such a gigantic company when it was... Uh, was running during the Dutch Golden Age, which was the basically the 16th century. It was by far the largest company in the world then, and in, in a pro router, it's still the largest company the world has ever seen. Uh, huge amount of shipbuilding, and people started trading shares in Amsterdam, uh, and it had the first became the first share market uh, in the world, centre of capitalism for a couple of hundred years in the West. And of course, the red light district, but. Uh... We did walk around a little bit of night, but I don't think um, we actually found it operating. And, and, and that, that's not the photograph leaning to this. <laughs> everything in Holland is built by brick, the roads, houses, everything that's a very limited amount of uh, stone. Uh, but there is a lean on lots and lots of buildings, a lot leaning far more than the, uh, the, the, uh, the Tower of Pisa. And the Dutch have a thing with windows. As far as the Dutch are concerned, a window is an eye into your home and they decorate their windows so people can look in and, uh, and enjoy what they're seeing. In this case, the windows are uh, decorated by pretty young girls. <laughs> That's right. Passing men to look at as they pass by. But um, in most cases, you know, was, as Rob said, beautiful displays, which uh, invite you in. We came down to Amersfoort. Uh, which um, is a, um, a, well, it was a, just a, a fabulous sort of fortress uh, town, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, where um, we walked in uh, and we had dinner uh, in this restaurant, one of the best meals that we've had. You look down over the canal. Again, there's the bike. Uh, there's bikes. Everybody goes by bike. Um, and uh, in actual fact, um, I found uh, them rather scary because they go so quick uh, and you can't hear them like a car. Uh, and there was everybody on there. Um, from 95-year-old grandmothers to tiny little, you know, three or four-year-olds, but everybody goes around on a bike, um, which is, well, it's just fantastic. So, so this town and a few of the others we've just looked at were, were actually seaports, but once the Isomir Lake was formed, they're, they are probably uh, 15, 20 kilometres from the salt water. But they started off as seaports, but a number of them were members of the Hanseatic League, which is a... a uh, a free trade society for, for, for uh, cities along the Baltic and that area of the North, North Sea and became very powerful at the same time as the Dutch Golden Age. We've left there now, and this, this is into the Beck River, the CHT, which is supposedly, -E -A -C -H -T, yeah. uh, supposedly the uh, most beautiful uh, river in Europe, uh, which is quite short. It flows uh, probably for 40 k's from 
the sea up to uh, Utrecht, which in ancient times was as far as the Romans got. But uh, what was fantastic for me is because I'm Irish and was born in Ireland and brought up there and whatever, was that we came across this couple with Abbasol, uh, which is one of the very original old barges built in um, 1905. Um, and um, we sailed with them for um, all, well, for over two seasons, which was fantastic. But being so old, uh, she did have a few problems uh, with her motor and whatever. So we spent a little bit of time waiting for them in various spots, but it was wonderful. We had a few parties on board and, and uh, whatever, but it was a, a wonderful thing to be able to do. The original barges, uh, like Abbasol, which Abbasol was originally built, uh, were peat boats. Um, and uh, I have to say that in some cases, uh, as we've read up on it, they were actually pulled by women, um, particularly if they were going through a tunnel uh, and as we know, the tunnels are terribly, terribly narrow, uh, and the women would just go along the ledges and uh, pull these um, peat boats. So uh, um, I was glad we went back in uh, in that time. They still have a few copies of the harnesses they used to put on the women, which <laughs> Absolutely. is not, not uh, tried upon these days. But the Beck River is beautiful, lots of fabulous houses, uh, and houses that are coming to uh, find a home. Um, this was a, a houseboat. Uh, that had actually just come through that uh, lock there. Um, and we were here, we're tied up here. And he came through and asked if he could tie up to us as he came through. A million dollars it is evidently to um, uh, buy a, a, a position to put your houseboat. Uh, and that's what he was doing was going up river and his wife and family up river uh, to um, find a spot to uh, uh, moor their houseboat. And uh, they, uh, they take precedence evidently over uh, houses, so you've got a house there and you might suddenly lose your view because a houseboat comes in, in front of it. Um, so now we're coming down to, um, we've come through Slick, haven't we? Yeah. So, and, um, and coming down um, down this area. So here. Well, well into the second year at this stage and the, the plot is to go um, down to the uh, Moose River and, and find a spot to stay there for the winter and then continue down to France the next year. Fields like that was just wonderful. Rob and I were anchored, uh, we were just here. Um, we walked up and that was a farmhouse and a vineyard. Uh, and we were able to get fantastic duck eggs and wine and uh, uh, whatever and walk back to our, uh, um, where we were tied up. Um, but there's beautiful fields um, along the way. Uh, and then we came to, um, to Houston, uh, which Rob will tell you a bit about. Well, it's traditionally a trading port, so, uh... The, uh, the marina was, was there, but in ancient times, or Middle East, in the Middle Ages, it was just a, a trading port. And the sculpture that you can see around it is the, uh, is the defensive forts, which were built of stone and earth, and they carted great cannons in, so that anyone who wanted to do anything nasty to them had to arrive across uh, water or bog, pulling whatever cannons they could, and they'd turn up at these place like Houston, which had much bigger cannons, surrounded by water, and were virtually uh, impregnable, impregnable until uh, they started to develop explosive uh, artillery. Uh, this is uh, near the marina where we were anchored, and uh, just to the right is the uh, is part of the old wall. There's the wall there, yes, going around. But what we couldn't get over, it's very close to um, um, the, the central of the EU uh, in Brussels uh, and uh, in this little square behind here was the biggest array of, of um, supercars, uh, luxury cars that uh, Rob and I have seen in, in, a, in a long time. So uh, there's a bit of money well, there. Never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, and then after that, we went to a dear little place called Woodrickham, which um, reminded me of something like out of Africa or whatever. Uh, and uh, just as calm as anything, there were ducks, geese, and uh, it was it was just absolutely superb. At that stage, uh, friends of Tasmania that were sailed all with us all the way around Tassie and up the east coast of Australia, uh, and the Mediterranean joined us uh, as we were heading down to uh, to Maastricht. Uh, but tankers and um, tugs and uh, um, these huge barges come and go very very quickly, so. Uh, um, you've got to keep your eye out um, for, for them um, pretty much all the time. So go, go, going up the moose at this stage, you'd see one of these barges, which is probably, that's probably um, 3,000 tonnes, would be in sight nearly all the time. There'd be a barge uh, 
uh, somewhere. So you could say that these 3,000 barges were nearly as thick as trucks on the uh, Canberra to Sydney uh, highway. So, so a tremendous amount of stuff being carted up and down. What you actually can't see on this one is that they always travel with their car on the back as well. So when they arrive at the spot, they can unload their car. Big in, getting into the big um, big locks there, Dave made a comment that he hadn't seen me putting any ropes um, we're looking this morning. I actually, I think I had just tied up there and Rob had come to join me. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> some, some of those locks on the moose, there's a small one for the likes of us and next door would be something which might be um, 300 metres long and, uh, and uh, 30 or 40 metres wide. But uh, mostly you shared with the big ones, but sometimes you didn't. We're now in um, Maastricht. Um, and that's where we uh, tied up right in the, um, the very center of uh, Maastricht. Maastricht, as I'm sure you all know, is the home of André Rieu. Uh, sadly, he wasn't home, so he didn't ask us up to have a cup of tea in his castle. Um, but uh, it's a beautiful town, and I actually sat in the square where uh, he has his um, yearly concerts, and uh, it was just absolutely superb. Uh, and um, you can see us um, here. Uh, and then that's the, um, the the bridge, which Rob will tell you a bit about. Oh, the bridge was built in 12, around about 1250, replacing a Roman bridge that had been there for a thousand years. So it's still used for um, for most traffic. Uh, I, I don't think any of the large trucks are allowed over. Uh, and you're not supposed to drive under it. The, um, the, um, the access for boats is down the left-hand side there. But... Um, and we went down through here and left Lena down in the marina, didn't we? Down, yeah. down, down the back there before we came back the next year uh, to head into um, head into Belgium. So this is the first lock in Belgium, uh, and uh, we realised that uh, there's a whole different kettle of fish with the the size of the locks. That there were some huge, huge ones uh, which we hit um, first as we uh, we came in there. Um, this one, uh, we're on our own, which is most unusual, uh, because normally you've got a, quite a few of the, the big barges in there with you, but uh, we, we had that one totally um, to ourselves. The industrial area we hit uh, pretty much first, so I was a little bit disappointed, thinking, my God, this is Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't stay there. Um, well, it, it, it went on and on, but we were lucky enough um, com coming into here. Um, when I say lucky enough, it, 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 um, it soon passed and we were into some of the most superb country uh, and um, in, into uh, to Leeds, um, where we, um, we were tied up here and we managed to go and get our internet and uh, whatever we sorted out there. Yeah. Uh, from Leeds, um, again, we came, well, we came out into the country um, and uh, thought we were doing brilliantly. Uh, I think I was about to have a glass of wine here when a fellow arrived on the end of the, of the side of the boat and knocked, got on board and demanded to uh, uh, see all our papers and uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, as Rob would uh, tell you in, in, in Holland, isn't it? But, uh, well, in Holland, uh, you don't have to register a boat or pay for a skipper's license. If, uh, if it's under 15 metres, uh, anyone over the age of about six can drive it. And uh, they'd take it as a great affront of their liberties if uh, someone tried to make, make them pay for registering their boats. But... Uh, in Belgium, they were absolutely alarmed that our boat wasn't registered and uh, they threatened that uh, jail almost if we hadn't registered our boat within, uh, within a week. So, uh, and we were really only going through uh, Belgium fairly quickly, hoping, you know, go, going down to France. So, uh, uh, but uh, he, um, he was certainly very, very officious. Uh, that's some of the beautiful country that we passed uh, after leaving the industrial area and uh, Liege um, and was absolutely stunning the uh, the countryside uh, that we um, that we went uh, past there. A lot of money, and it's hard to know where it uh, it comes from. We think it perhaps came from uh, from the uh, the Dutch Congo, but uh, where a lot of money was stolen off the people. But uh, anyway, we kept going, and this is uh, Namur, which is another. All these towns along this stretch of the river have, have had lots of fortifications since uh, industrial times and they all played parts in uh, World War One and World War Two. that matter. And the fortress behind is uh, was one of the uh, the first ones that the Germans attacked in uh, World War One, and uh, it's actually where, uh, where uh, Julius Caesar is reputed to have uh, lounged on his horse and surveyed things after he cleaned up the last of the uh, 
the Belgian tribes in this area in, I think it was, um, uh, I guess in 70 BC or around that, uh, that period. As far, this is about as far north as Caesar got in uh, his conquest. More importantly for me, across this bridge, around here and into there was a great shopping centre and I needed new shoes. So <laughs> I've got some uh, shoes, which unfortunately I've had to leave behind in, on Lena in, um, in Strasbourg. Um, there's just a, um, a Dutch barge actually um, sailing in, in um, uh, Denant. Um, was uh, Another place, tripping. big for fortifications behind it. And uh, this is a town where uh, Charles de Gaulle made, uh, made his name in the First World War. First World War and, got a uh, citation for bravery before being captured uh, a few months later and spending the rest of the First World War in, uh, in a, as a prisoner of the Germans. But uh, again, a very interesting town, a lovely back street to it. And um, That street there, in actual fact, was called Winston Churchill Street. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, they uh, seem to have a lot of monuments and uh, streets called after uh, Winston Churchill. There's still a big river at this stage, mostly uh, oh, four or 500 yards wide. A little bit of current, not much, and uh, deep enough to take anything. There's still commercial barging, but not nearly as much. Most of it stopped at Namur, but we might have seen one or two commercial barges at this stage. This is a, a brick palace. It looks like a monastery. And uh, uh, we've just now arrived in uh, Givet, which is the first uh, stop in France. We, we're uh, a bit alarmed coming into France because it's renowned a renowned place to be uh, difficult to get a French uh, license. You have to sit the exam in, uh, in French and uh, I was worried that they might look down their nose at my Australian qualifications and not let us in. But uh, in actual fact, uh, as soon as we paid our, um, our thousand euros for, uh, to get into France, everyone was happy and uh, they didn't talk in English. We didn't talk in French and we uh, proceeded on our way. But what was amazing when we came in there, you can see we're the only boat. Uh, everything was closed and we're, we're talking May, aren't we? Yes, in May. Uh, and we went to uh, check in as you're supposed to do, but there was absolutely no one to check in. But uh, after a couple of days, a few more boats and uh, actually a New Zealand couple came as well. And uh, our friends, another lot of friends from Tasmania joined us there. Um, so here we are up up the very top, um, uh, come, which we've arrived in, into, uh, into France. So... Uh... Locks are, <coughs> locks are about to become a problem They're, uh, for the rest of the river. So we're getting up towards the top of the Meuse River at the stage, and there are 59 locks from here to the top uh, and a few tunnels. So this is the first tunnel we were going to go through. We've taken down our uh, canopy and uh, asked questions of everyone how, how, uh, how much room there is in the lock. And allegedly, we've got about a foot to spare going through the lock, but it's turned the out tunnel. to be uh, through the tunnel but it turned out to be a bit more, more than that. So here we are, this tunnel is uh, 600 metres long, basically it's a relatively short one. The, the roof looked, um, looked rough and you couldn't be sure everything was the same height. It was dug around about the 1850s. They haven't done anything to it that I could notice. And along the right hand side, there's a, a ledge which uh, horses or women could pull, pull, pull the barges through. Uh, but you can't see it while you're driving. So you still need a good woman. In this case, to shout at you and tell you to keep to the left more. I, think I lost my voice going, running from one uh, one side to the other, uh, telling him to either go left, right, or, or port or stern or, or whatever. But uh, um, we managed to get through without hitting anything, which was uh, fantastic. And we came out in this uh, a little bit later in this wonderful little uh, uh, village. And uh, But what uh, had happened was a boat here that actually got stuck there for... Um, uh, the whole of the season before, because unfortunately in the north of uh, France, a lot of the uh, canals are silting up uh, and they're not doing much to unsilt them. Uh, and they've had um, uh, not enough rain uh, one season and then too much rain uh, another season. So you have got to be careful that you allow yourself time because you can actually um, get stuck there for quite a while. And in actual fact, after we left here, only about three or four days, wasn't it? they closed uh, the canal coming out of there uh, and we would have got stuck there as well. So um, it's a little bit alarming that uh, that, can, um, that can happen. Uh, Carmel and Philip, our friends from Tassie were on board and uh, it's always helpful to have a little bit of extra 
muscle uh, because the flow of the water, um, you can see actually up through here, the flow of the water coming through is really strong. Uh, and sometimes I had trouble uh, holding onto, uh, onto the rope. Um, so they don't make it easy, the French do, to put in anything that might be uh, convenient for you. You can see there's, there's no bollards in the wall there and the only thing to tie on was a, uh, was a ladder. So the alternative is to um, climb up the slippery ladder, which uh, I certainly didn't want to do and I couldn't talk Rosemary into doing it either. <laughs> was to hang on to whatever you could find. But, uh, so you go from one, you just take it off there, up to there, up to there, up to there, up to there, till you get to the, uh, get to the top. So um, it can be a little bit um, difficult. Uh, we came to this lovely place, Charles de Maisieux, uh, and uh, that's just the, uh, the town square. It looks fantastic from here, uh, but sadly, um, a lot of these uh, areas up the top have just been deserted, uh, and uh, a lot of them are just going uh, to, to ruin, and they just haven't got the money to... Uh, um, to, to um, well, just to renovate or do anything yeah. with it. So from 300 metres away, we thought we'd buy one, but when we got close, we That's changed, right. changed our minds. Exactly. So we're starting to get in, into places now where the, the moose is ca ca canalised, the river has shrunk, and in places they've created can canals to, uh, to one side to uh, enable them to hold the water or to cut out parts where... Um, where it's running too much. Yeah. Now, this is, I have to show you this because I was absolutely fascinated. Sadly, as I said, a lot of the villages that we went through were closed. The only place you could get a, a, a meal was a, was a pizza parlor or a kebab shop uh, because a lot of the young, like here and I suppose in Australia as well, have taken off and gone to France. Uh, and this village particularly was, was, was a prime example. We tied up to the shore and I wanted to go off to buy my baguettes, no baguettes, but I met this lovely lady who told me to come with her. And there was a baguette machine, and you put your money in there, and out, out came a baguette. Uh, so it's certainly not as romantic as the boulangerie. Uh, oh, it's probably not how you pronounce it, Jill. Oh, no, she's Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it, it, um, at least you, we were able to get some lovely fresh bread, and I'm told they actually have pizza uh, machines like that as well. Um, that was Stene, um, which... Um, uh, a gorgeous, really lovely, lovely little town with its markets, as, as most of the towns have travelling markets that go from one to the other, so we would follow quite often on. So this is coming into Verdun, which is a uh, obviously a, a famous World War uh, One battle, one of the most bloody battles of the uh, the war. I think there are uh, around about seven hundred thousand casualties on both sides, um, and uh, so there's Verdun. There. Sorry, mm. um, that's Verdun here. Yeah. Verdun there. And uh, we tied up in the middle of town, which uh, some places were free in France, which often meant they were full with uh, boats that stay there uh, forever. But uh, this was uh, naked and free, and it was only uh, 100, 200 yards to the uh, main street shopping. And uh, we probably stayed there for 10 days or a week. I know. It was great. And, and behind us, you can't see it, was a New Zealand boat. Uh, and uh, behind that, further on, was an Australian one. So we all... Uh, uh, went ashore and um, and had a, a, a few um, so, uh, hide, hide, hide of some of it. You'll notice I'm still wearing a, a warm red yes. jacket. <laughs> That's right. Um, the fortifications in um, in Verdun. Um, back out into uh, into the countryside. Into, All um, right. So we're just about at the top of uh, top of the uh, the moors now, and uh, through this stage we're, we're scraping our. Uh, our bottom quite often and it was uh, the water looks lovely but it's quite weedy and we need to clean our, uh, our water filter probably every two or three hours to uh, to keep the engine cool uh, and we're about to uh, finish with the moves and then um, the country is still lovely beautiful and uh, we've run out of a map because between where we're looking at now and the top of the moves was probably the hardest day we had a, had a float which was a thousand metre tunnel and then down 13 locks and no one had not even Rosemary had time to uh, to uh, take photographs so we haven't got a photograph of that whole day but it was an exhausting day but when we finally uh, passed through the town of Tool and a couple of days later we came onto the Moselle which is uh, which was lovely. And very great for the game that Hubie our grandson turned up to uh, give us a little bit of uh, relief um, to um, go through a few of the locks and whatever and he came with us uh, along this stretch uh, and down um, to Nancy, 
uh, which um, is really a magnificent town. It's got a huge amount of gold filigree and uh, whatever stacks of restaurants and uh, um, it was just lovely. I, I think it's number two in the in the listed uh, places to go in France uh, after uh, after Paris. Um, absolutely beautiful and yeah. friendly and lots to eat. And from actually from Nancy, we we went to Paris because uh, we had a little bit of an accident with Rob's passport. Uh, we uh, got dunked, uh, so we needed to get a new passport, and uh, so we went down to. Uh, uh, Paris and met up with my brother who was going to join us and we had a lovely four or five days in Paris before Eugene came back with us uh, and uh, we then sailed on with him and his wife from Nancy uh, out into the countryside. I just want to show you this because I think it's um, great for people that um, have visitors on board. In a lot of areas there's bike tracks that go along the side so if you've got somebody on board with bikes or wants to ride bikes or whatever you can drop them off in one place and then um, meet up with them uh, down the track a bit. So uh, that, that's important to, uh, to know. So the, the canal we're on now is, uh, it runs across France from uh, east to west, basically from the Marne River uh, across to the, uh, the Rhine. And this is the, uh, the tallest lock in France, which is 26, uh, 26 metres. So you're driving through a little tunnel and then into this, the manually um, operated, a lot, of the lock, a lot of the locks are automatic in France, but this was manual. If they're manual, the, uh, the, the people uh, are heavily unionised and never open during lunch. If they're automatic, uh, generally you'll, they work um, from nine to five or six all the time. Well, as you had said, David, you see men can't multitask. I was obviously holding a big rope down the back and taking a photo at the same time. <laughs> So, um, Perhaps with you, yeah. with you then, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I understand. On board. Um, then out into um, a lovely stretch of water again. Um, do you want a, a boat cache? We had to be careful here going through the lock um, because all the cats wanted to uh, to get on board, but we uh, had to unsadly decline their uh, um, enthusiasm. Um, so, so we've just come. Um, at the top of the range again, and uh, the canal from here on drops down uh, to the Rhine. You can see we've got uh, down here 40, probably 60 or 70 locks to get through to um, to get to the Rhine. And by, by this stage, you start to be a bit fed up with locks, I must admit, particularly when it's one every um, uh, kilometre or so, and you start to long for the open canals of, of Holland where you can motor all day and not be hindered by locks. This was fascinating, but Rob will tell you a bit about the history of that. That's, um, that uh, well, it was built in 1950, but we, we went through, this was another hard day. There was another uh, thousand kilometre tunnel leading back, here. Mm. back there, which we've got a photo of, through to this inclinator. And um, can you get it? This, this is a, a large trough, like a bath, which normally sits up there. So you drive into that. And uh, they shut the door, and you slide down to here. They open the door, and you you sail out. And so that that was seventy years old, and the tunnel uh, uh, eighteen fifty was uh, a bit over two hundred years old, two hundred fifty years old. So far, yeah. something yeah, was ab absolutely yeah. incredible. I I um, I was fascinated by it. Uh, because yeah, you know, I've taken this from where Lena is here, just sitting there uh, and looking down. And then we were going. We were. I think we're probably possibly even on the way down, being lowered down through here. Uh, and then down into that uh, stretch of water down there. So the bird life yeah. everywhere was uh, lovely the whole trip. It was one of the features of the trip. But here is one little, uh, which I'll run through quickly. I lost my heart to a, a mother swan who flew up at dusk, had a look around, flew back down the river. And then the next morning as we we're going out of a lock, I'm sure it was the same mother, mother swan and husband and about a dozen chicks out into the, uh, the lock because the, the young ones couldn't fly, the mother wanted to get them up to the higher stretch of the river. So they used the lock, which I, I thought was quite intelligent. For, they, they came uh, with us. For noble birds, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, Musselburgh was a beautiful little town. But again, sadly, um, the, the boulangerie was closed um, and uh, we tried to get a meal. Uh, we did eventually in a little pub up here, but uh, um, there wasn't much open at all. And when we talked to the locals and they say, well, you know, fortunately, that the young ones have um, have taken off. So we're into into the mountains there. They're the Berg Mountains in the in the background. This was Lucerne, which uh, very much sort of Austrian architecture. 
uh, and uh, we actually met up again with um, John and Jill, who were the uh, ones um, that um, we, we um, had met previously, who were on a boat with a, uh, a sear boat, which a number of people do. Uh, they actually share a boat with six other couples, and they take it in turns to have their uh, their time on on the uh, on the boat. And that's uh, John and Jill there. We tied up to a uh, lovely little area uh, and sailed with them for uh, pretty much the rest of the trip down to um, down to Lucerne. And uh, and we made great friends, and they've just been to stay with us here. So uh, it's lovely that you feel that you can do that in the middle of France and uh, meet up with. Um, uh, like-minded people and end up being um, great buddies, which is fantastic. Um, so now we're coming into Strasbourg, um, and that was the first site of Str Strasbourg, but um, that's very much so, the head of the EU, isn't it? So um, Strasbourg shares the uh, governance of the EU with Brussels. I think they're either the legislative branch or the administrative branch, I forget which, but they move everyone there from Brussels for one week a month and... Uh, they soon have their own special train, which is Graffiti Three, Graffiti, graffiti Three, and runs in full of bureaucrats, um, and then takes them all back to Strasbourg, but to Brussels. But they've built a number of palaces like this one, which is. Uh, but, but fortunately, the old town still remains, doesn't it? The old town's beautiful, and the canals are, are here are, are more beautiful than anywhere. I think it's, it's, it has more fuel than Venice or uh, Amsterdam and uh, flowers everywhere and uh, beautiful canals. And we had a number of meals in this uh, restaurant here, which were That's our as, table. Good, as good as anywhere. It, it was lovely. And, and the food was, was, was um, the food fantastic. Was, was good, fantastic. Yeah. Um, again, just uh, more of Strasbourg. You can't um, bring, bring your own boat into the canals. Uh, we uh, were uh, more, in, in actual fact, it's where Lena is now, uh, out of Strasbourg, about um, probably about a 20-minute uh, uh, walk uh, in, but um, uh, she's out there in Marina, but you can catch, well, you can catch an Uber in or walk in, which is great. Uh, or they do have uh, tourist boats that take you around, which I did uh, with a, another friend of ours that arrived, uh, and they take you all the way around, but they don't let you go into Strasbourg. Uh, with your um, with your own boat, which is um, is fair. Well, you wouldn't just get in under the bridges and, and whatever, but it is an absolutely beautiful town or city. Then we went up into the wine area, um, and uh, that is Riquet, uh, and uh, again magnificent architecture, uh, beautiful cobbled streets, restaurants, um, and uh, vineyards that come right right down. Uh, into um, the, the villages themselves. And uh, it's in the Alsace, and of course, Alsace is, is known for all its wines. Um, and, um, fabulous architect. Uh, and they are talking, yes, the vineyards, uh, uh, all the stretch uh, between Strasbourg, uh, all the way along the Alsace is just absolutely uh, chock a block full of, um, of, of um, vineyards. And there we are. Cheers and happy sailing. And if you want to read a little bit more about where we've been and whatever, um, there is uh, Rob's books, volumes one and, uh, and volume two. Uh, and uh, not just um, about um, the uh, uh, canals, but also about the Mediterranean, uh, but uh, Tasmania, the east coast of Australia, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and I think it's a great read, <laughs> but I'm biased. <laughs> but thank you very much for uh, Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, Rosemary. Um, yeah, we thank you. It was really fascinating talk and, and very, very interesting. And uh, I second those books. I enjoyed them a lot. <laughs> well, I have, haven't read the second one. I <laughs> the first one. Um, James, have you got um, some questions or? Uh, Yes, I do have one question. But firstly, if anybody wants to talk directly and ask a question, they can raise their hand. Yeah, uh, in the participants panel, or well, on the bottom of your screen should be a raise hand thing. But there is one question: Was there any question, the question of security, or any issues about safety when your travels? Um, no. Uh, some of the um, the uh, neighbourhoods around some of the big cities uh, were a bit unnerving. Um, uh, Utrecht. 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 Mm. Uh, didn't really feel safe walking through that. 
But apart from that, only on one occasion in one of the little French towns, a, um, a drunk oh, yeah. jumped on the <laughs> jumped on the back of the boat just as I was about to shut the door, and we both gave ourselves a big squeeze, <laughs> a scare, and he he got off and uh, apologised greatly and said he was drunk, which he was. <laughs> but apart from that, um, uh, not at all. Rosemary got angry at, at, from time to time, and I felt unsafe. But uh, apart from oh, that. Right. <laughs> No, uh, Utrecht particularly, because you can't hang Utrecht, the, the centre of the town is fantastic and, and uh, lighted what it's like at night. But during the day, it's just touristy. But we had to anchor out a bit of there. Uh, and uh, it was a, a, an area where you had to walk a long way to go to the supermarket. Uh, and um, I didn't feel quite safe there on, on my own. But uh, uh, on, on the whole, look, we, we, um, we, we were fine. That was about the only place. Yeah. But Rob always travels. What he tra travels with the baseball bat yeah. under the by the bed. <laughs> Apart from that, we have a lot of uh, thank yous. A great talk, wonderful photos, and great talk. Thank you. And uh, Isabel, she's got beautiful distillations. She has wanderlust. Yes. It's... You're killing us. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any plans to go up the Rhine? Um. The original, we had a number of plans. We, we did we did end up going, we, we contemplated going back down the Rhine, um, but then we decided that if we had more seasons, we'd actually go back through the centre of France down to the Mediterranean. But we, we did get on a... Um, on a um, the Royal Crown, which the was... A, Crown, yeah. uh, honestly, if anybody wants to do the trip, it's the most beautiful boat. It only had 70 passengers. Uh, but we did think we were running out of time. So we um, we booked on that and we did the Moselle and the Rhine uh, for eight days in the middle of this um, of this cruise. And it was, look, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, but we must also emphasize that we were planning to go back this year uh, and continue, of course, through France and, uh, and then to perhaps go back up to Holland uh, and uh, over to Bruges and all that area. But as we know, things change. Mm. We always had, a, had a, an ambition to uh, to go up the Main and then down the Danube, but um, I, the older I get, the more I found I'm worried about mechanical failure and that um, it's very hard to get mechanical assistance during uh, July, August. Everyone's on holidays and uh, the last thing they want to do is uh, worry about some Australians whose batteries go on <laughs> That's nice. I think uh, I, you had a question, JT. Yeah, yeah may I, I just uh, ask a question, David? Uh, it, 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 you make it sound like it's very easy and feasible that you just you just go over to sneak by yourself a boat and the next day you're on the water and off you go and everything's all rosy and you know restaurants and wine but uh, is, is it is it something that that our, our cruising people could contemplate as a couple taking it on or do you think you need to have oh, sort of established absolutely. absolutely there's there's um... There's nothing difficult about it, really. There's, there's, uh, you're driving at five or six kilometres an hour through still water. The um, the idea of the, the the locks are intimidating until you do one, but they're all operated on lights, and most people are are, are, are pleasant. And uh, although the books say uh, you've got to give way to commercial boats, uh, quite often we'd be waiting there in a, a large commercial barge and say, well, you know, where you go, you got to go first. Go in, so um, it would would be helpful if you had a Dutch speaker. I must admit, but, but yeah, but they again, all speak English. No, well, not, not everyone. But a lot do. Yeah. Yeah. Much more than France, don't they? Yeah, much, yeah. much more than France. But so, um, you know, we did. I have to say, JT, that uh, were the people that actually bought a boat on the internet in the Mediterranean uh, without seeing it, but it was a brand new Beneteau. Uh, but um, we'd pretty we'd done a lot of research before we went as to what sort of boat we wanted. And De Valk, D E B A L K, is the huge uh, uh, boat uh, people in Sneak. Um, you either had the, you could either go to Sneak or Utrecht, and we ended up going. We decided we wanted to go north, so we went to Friesland, uh, and they were very helpful. And um, they keep because the winter's so cold, of course, they keep all their boats, their show boats and whatever, under these huge, big, um, uh, enclosed showrooms, so you can just walk around and see what uh, what you want and. Uh, um, we we um, discarded a few, and then Lena jumped out and said, "Look at me! Look at me! Look at me!" So we ended up getting her. Mm. It's, not, it's not as difficult as sailing from Sydney to Brisbane or something like that. I don't know. It's, 
Well, well that, that's great, Robert. I've just, I've just got one last question. What's the, uh, the outlook for Lena at the moment? Well, um, it's been bought, but we haven't got the money yet. She's going to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, we just felt that uh, we're not going to get back. I don't think any of us are going to get back, sadly, overseas for at least a year or so, or possibly more. Uh, and we were worried that she would end up as a wreck at the bottom of the sea. And we've seen enough of those uh, in the Med and, um, in, well, even in the canals and in, in some of the ports. And we didn't want it to end up like that. So mm -hmm. sadly, we have sold her and she's off to a new owner in Switzerland. But it's nostalgic looking at her, I must admit. Well, you can look it up next time you're over there in a couple of years. Time. I have a question. You go ahead, James. What's September like? What's September like? Yeah, yeah great, great. No, re really, uh, really good. Uh, in actual fact, uh, if you're talking to the locals, uh, they would tell you that September is, is probably the, um, one, the best month. And even into October uh, is, is good. But um, apart from the... Well, in, in France, of course, it gets very, very hot. Uh, but in Holland, uh, it's, um, you've got to expect cold nights and, and uh, the cold days, but then you might uh, end up... We actually ended up in May uh, having some of the hottest days of the whole season, and then it got cold yeah. again. A bit like Tasmania. But the, the Dutch Barge Association reckons that the French canals have probably only got another four or five years in them, because there's just... Um, there's, apart from the area where there's a lot of rental boats, there's very little maintenance done, and mm. uh, the banks are... Are collapsing, uh, silting, silting up, a lot of weeds, and um, a lot of them are shutting anyway by the end of uh, June, July, because there's uh, a water shortage. Yeah, yeah. But just lack of maintenance, mainly. Well, it's the massive debt to GDP ratio in France is their problem, isn't it? No money. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. is, but we're but, very glad we were able to do but, it. But well. as a facility, I think the French Canal will probably provide more for fishermen and uh, bicyclists and, and uh, yachts. And coming up the Meuse, occasionally we'd only see two boats a day. Mm. Um, and we definitely saw more, more Kiwi boats than French boats, for instance. Um, but, so the days are numbered, unfortunately. But then again, if you go down to the Canal de Midi, uh, and down in that area, of course, it's much busier. Uh, and I think they cater much more for, well, I know, because we went there when we bought um, Sea Dreams, our yacht, we bought it in Roussan uh, in the south of France, and we went up the Canal de Midi, and, and that was very, very busy. And I would imagine it's probably still uh, exactly the same, but up the north, it, it's much, much quieter. Uh, and, the, and the canals aren't uh, looked after as well as Rob says. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we recommended it, absolutely. If we're ever allowed overseas again, <laughs> <laughs> but at least we're, we're allowed um, between states. That's something at the moment. Are you going to do a book on that, that part? We were planning on doing a book, and we've certainly taken enough photos. But I don't know. Have we travelled far enough to to do? We probably would certainly be able to do one on Holland because we've covered the most of Holland. Uh, but we were planning, of course, to do uh, to do a lot more. But uh, uh, it would then be our sixth coffee table book, you know, starting off with the one in Tasmania that uh, you and Jill feature in so much. Uh, and um, it, it would have been great to do it. And look, we may, may well, well do that, absolutely. Uh, but um, uh, not something we've done right now. But we have got all the photos ready to go if we need to. Looking forward to that. Well, yeah, we've, right. bought a, we've bought another stink boat for uh, Morton Bay and Broadway. Yes. Yeah. You know, learn. That's right. Yes. No. It's it's, it's tragic, yeah. really, isn't it? Going from a yacht to a, a stink You're boat. Dedicated stink boat people are now. Uh, we'll forgive you. <laughs> All right. Well, look. Thank you very much again, Rob and Rob. We better wrap it up. It's um, we've done done the hour as planned. That's very nice, and your timing was perfect. Uh, the maps were clear, and, and the pictures were wonderful. So, thank you, thank you once again. Thank and, you very uh, much. Yeah, Thanks, JT. Thanks, uh, Thank James. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thank, you, thank you everybody in. For, uh, for tuning in. Uh, for, if we'd been having this live, we would have presented you with a bottle of wine. So oh. I'll, I'll you want to, uh, you want to address a squadron of wine and I'll hold it for you. <laughs> We've got our glasses there, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. I'll go and have one. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again. David, just before we, we close,